The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for The Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It is Henry Zamoda and Danny of Deljabar. Hello, Danny. What's up, man? How you doing? Doing well. Had a long day, and I feel like my voice is going to crack throughout today's episode. I can just feel it coming. Well, I think we're used to it by now. <laughs> yeah. The combination of not much, not getting much sleep and spending most of my day talking to people has really doesn't by 9 a.m 10 p.m or 9 a.m 9 p.m doesn't do wonders for your voice no it doesn't <laughs> no, no, it, no, yeah, no it doesn't what are you laughing at <laughs> i don't know it's just it's, it's obvious <laughs> yeah that's not good for your voice um what's up guys welcome to another episode Today, we're going to be speaking about something that's very close and dear to my heart. And that is the Polish people. The reason Polish. why the, the Polish people are dear to my heart is because my forefathers are from a land that may have been called Poland at one point. And I have a Polish last name. Zamoda. Zamoda. Zamo- Sismoda, like the average normal person. Is that, is that actually how it's pronounced in Polish? Do you know how it's actually pronounced, or are we just pronouncing Shim- it? It's pronounced Shimoda in Poland, in Polish. Shimota. Shimota. Would you like a smoke and a pancake? A smoke and a Shimota? <laughs> well, my name was almost Stanislav Shimota. Yeah, I remember that. That's actually a really fun fact. Stanislav. And Stanislav Shimota was almost my name. I have, a, I think, an uncle... A great uncle who was um, some military commander, and my dad wanted to name me after him. Um, the other name was Joseph. Joseph Zamoda was the other option, which was another military man. But they went with Henry, and ironically, my grandfather is named Henrik. My mother's maiden name is Henry. And they're just like, all right, well, here's some common ground. Why don't we just call him Henry? Your and... maiden name, my father's name. Was there, there any, was there any Henrys Henry. in your family that were in the military? No. I'm, I honestly think... I did the little family search history on Ancestry.com, and I went back to my family tree as far as I could, as far as they have records, and there's no Henry. There's no Henrik. There are Stanislavs. There are Ludwigs. There are... Um, what are some other ones? Siegfrieds. There are... Those are all um, German names. <laughs> yeah, they're actually all they're German names as well. It's kind of, Henrik's also, I guess Henrik can be a lot of different things. But, Heinrich? You know, Hein <laughs> Heinrich. There's, um, I guess there's, 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 you know, Europeans can share names or different cultures can share names, especially within the same region. But yeah, the I Polish mean, that's a really people, good segue for for today's episode, actually, just because you know you're of Polish descent, but you know bunch of the people in your ancestry all have german last names and you know to the you know out, outside person looking in that's like well i thought you said you were polish those are a bunch of german names and i guess what we'll find out today is is just how closely intertwined those are but first before we get into this we need to talk about my favorite thing about polish my polish heritage and what's that polish jokes <laughs> so, and it's my one. It's, uh, this is the only time I can be discrim. I can discriminate against people because it's my own people. So <laughs> I, I take that card and run with it. 
So, did you hear this one? Which one? Did you hear about the Polak who thought his wife was trying to kill him? No. On her dressing table, he found a bottle of polish remember, remover. Polish remover? <laughs> polish remover. Yuck, 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 yuck. Um, here's another one. What happened to the Polish hockey team? Uh, what's that? They all drowned in spring training. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> what? What is... What? Why is there no water in Poland? Why? Because the person who invented the formula died. Oh, that's a... I should have known that one. I knew that one. <laughs> <laughs> I got a dirty one for you. What? Why, why did the Polak put ice in his condom? <laughs> why? To keep the swelling down. <laughs> Wait, here's <laughs> another one. How did the Germans conquer Poland so fast? Oh, I feel like this one's going to take a dark turn. How? <laughs> They marched in backwards, and the Polish thought they were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> or here's the one that I that I think I've heard the most. And my other my other half of my family's Irish, so they used to always tell me Polish jokes. Um, how do you stop the Polish cavalry? Turn off the carousel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I know> that <laughs> one. you must have heard that one from me. <laughs> yeah. or, or here's one more. How do you know if you're in front of a Polish firing squad? How? They're standing in a circle. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, man. There's a million of these. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's so many of them. They're great, though. I love Polish jokes. Um, so uh, today, what we're going to do is that we're going to talk about Poland because it's a weird state. And Poland has a very confusing history. It is... Um, one of the most confusing histories in Europe, in my opinion. Most Central and Eastern European states have very complicated histories, and they have to do with partitions and and um, you know the restructuring of states and centuries of war. But I think the key thing to know that characterizes Polish history is that before World War One, the Poles were spread out in, across three different states. So they were low, they were they were the, the Polish diaspora was well I guess it wasn't a diaspora but Pol, Poland was spread out between Austria Hungary Germany and the Russian Empire. So I'm Polish. My family is actually from it's not my family's not even from like a Polish zone a, a Polish partition zone. My family is from Kiev which was part okay. of the Russian Empire which was part of Russia for for centuries. So you're Ukrainian and, then. Yeah, I guess I'm Ukrainian. Um, during World War One, my my family fought for the right. Like all their military history is is on the side of the Russians. Oh shit! So um, you're a Russian? I knew it. All those people in the comment section saying we're Russian shills. They they had something going. <laughs> they're they're correct. Traced back my family history. Turns out that <laughs> I'm I'm a Russophobe, or no, Russophile. Russophobe yeah. is absolutely. You're not afraid of them. He's the, he is the snake to my mongoose. He's the mongoose to my snake, or the snake to my mongoose. Whatever way, it's bad. From Austin Powers, um, when um, <clears throat> so yeah, my my family's from Kiev. Um, they were actually essentially kicked out of the country by the Bolsheviks after the Russian Revolution. Um, you know, they were they were apparently smuggled out. Because there was a death sentence signed on them, so their their servants had to, you know, they they were from a Polish nobility family, and their servants had warned them. They're like, "Hey, the shit's gonna go down, and um, you're you guys are marked for death." So they were smuggled out of the country by um, by basically dressing in like peasant attire, and then their their servants like got them out of the country and got them somehow got them to Italy first. And I, then I think the France where they lived for most of their life. And then eventually I think my grandfather went back to Poland for a little bit when, you know, Poland was the, the second Republic of Poland was created, you know, the state that's between, you know, world war one and, and, and uh, the Soviet annexation or the invasion of it. 
they ended up back in there because my grandfather was a bike racer and um then he moved to america i believe in the 40s but yeah i mean it's a very whatever, interesting history whatever happened to the uh the land that your family had it, it was confiscated by the soviet union you think so that maybe if things settle fam- down, you can get some reparations? <laughs> no reparations. My fam- So my Polish side of the family fucking hates communists mm-hmm. because the communists, like, took all of their possessions. I see. Um, but, yeah. They, it's all making a sense lot of now, po- Henry. <laughs> a lot of Poles. A lot of Poles. That, um, a lot of Poles in that part of the world were actually a wealthier class. And it has to stem for a whole bunch of reasons um, going back to kind of the feudal period. But... Um, going back to, you know, where the Poles were before World War One, the Polish state that we kind of know now doesn't really happen until the Russian Empire implodes during the, the Bolshevik Revolution, and then you know the Austrian-Hungarian Empire falls, and then and uh, you know the Germans are defeated during World War One. This Polish state it appears on a map out of nowhere. I mean, not out of nowhere, but it reappears on a map after a hiatus of about 150 years of not existing. Now, the problem with the creation of this new state in the 20th century, the definition of Poland wasn't really clear. On one hand, it could be considered the boundaries of the pre-partitioned Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. However, The problem with that is the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a multicultural state. It was sort of like the Russian Federation right now. You know, Mm -hmm. it was a bunch of different ethnicities. Um, Actually, Poles weren't even a majority. Um, The vast majority of people there were not ethnic Poles. That's that's something that's important to, to, to note when looking at the Commonwealth. And most of the people who lived in those borders really didn't have a a desire to live in a Polish state anyway. So on the other hand, Poland could be defined ethnically as the territory that's inhabited by Polish speakers. So this brings up the age old question of nationalism, specifically civic versus ethnic nationalism. Mm -hmm. And in Western Europe, you you have more of this cultural dynamic of civic nationalism countries like france and portugal and the netherlands and england uh, they were formed and perceived as unique entities within their respective states meaning these national identities were nurtured by centralized state institutions which fostered a civic duty to the state so the state served as a central focal point of identity, not necessarily the ethnicity. Right. However, Central, Eastern, and even Southern Europe are much different. In states like Germany and Italy, the sentiment of nationalism emerged before the establishment of these unified national states, meaning there were national movements before these states even existed. So before the German Empire even existed there was a national there were nationalist german movements you know before um you know many of these before italy before croatia um you know their primary source of national identity was not the state as itself it was their community it was the nation um you know the imagined community which what we we talk about all the time Right. And really, what is a nation? The nation in in Europe at this time, because all everyone's white, you know, there's not that much of a racial difference. It's a common language. You know, there's not that much. You can't really tell that much. You know, I'm I'm Polish. You can tell I'm. If you look at me and you know what Polish people kind of look like, you can. T- if you look at my face, you can tell I have a big Polish face. Polish people kind of look like Russian people. They kind of they're they're Slavic people. To me, I. You know, most Slavic people have kind of very, they look kind of similar. You can kind of tell. Um, so what's the difference? Like, why, like, why is there a history of so much, like, violence between these different groups in Central Europe? There's so much, there's such a large history of ethnic cleansing and genocide and just horrible murders between 
between uh, you know different Slavic groups and even Germans as well, which are which are close in in relation. Um, you know, the difference is really is you know two things, and and I think one takes priority later in the 20th century. It was you know first religion, and then it moved to becoming the common language, and then you know these these really just became political tools. They became political situation, uh, political differences. So being a Catholic or being a Lutheran in Europe, in pre-modern Europe, wasn't just a religion. It was a political affiliation. Right. Being a German speaker or being a Polish speaker in 19th century Prussia wasn't just your, your language, because a lot of people knew both languages. It was your ability to you know, receive jobs or, uh, the, to, you know, get the nepotism, <laughs> be, the, the nepotism benefits that go along with that. Right. So that's really what it is. It's the language and, right. you know, and different it, languages are. Cre- and, and this like bundling of, of ideologies by language or nationalism, or to your point, like maybe even religion in certain cases, this, uh, is specifically the, the language and nationalism bits were proposed you know, pretty early in, in the 19th century by <clears throat> German nationalists. Uh, and you kind of mentioned that already, but you know, it was basically during the Napoleonic Wars that destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, you know, the, the shock of the loss of, you know, what they considered their fatherland made a lot of German-speaking intellectuals come up with the idea that the German language is the defining characteristic of whatever future, and I guess the word nation really wasn't very super popular around this time, but whatever the future nation would be. And, you know, they, they borrowed here the term nation from, you know, this crazy revolutionary France that is trying out this new thing called nation states, right? Um, and the equation of, like, language with a with national spread to, you know, uh, basically every corner of, of Central Europe. And prior to that, you know, prior to the modern period um, of, of basically, like, this ethno-linguistic nationalism, uh, there was whole illiterate populations uh, that spoke their local dialects and rarely ventured outside of their place of origin. And, you know, these were, you know, peasants and, and they, they weren't really linked to any nobility class. And, and, and so the social and political gap between the peasantry and the nobility was much, much bigger than, you know, between, say, nobles of different religions or nobles of different regions. So realistically, ethno-linguistic nationalism what was what closed that gap between those those social strata, the the, the hierarchies between the, the rich and the poor, uh, and and this was imagined that you know oh we're closing this gap because we all speak the same language therefore we're all the same thing but you know it, it's really fascinating how that how that works out because there's so much that would have been different from you know your random you know small village German peasant versus your you know former Duke of wherever <laughs> you know. There's a lot of differences there with the exception of, of course, maybe they speak a similar language. Yeah. You know, the, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II had a lot more in common with, with Nicholas, with Tsar Nicholas II than their yeah. respective. I mean, they were cousins by the way, right? but right, then their res- then their, you know, their, their, uh, native populations. So all these nobility nobles had a lot more in common with the other rich than, than they did with their kind of homogeneous population and um it is you know if you look at the world of 1780 for example or the world prior to the, the you know the 18th century the world was just much smaller for people i mean not just on a local level the world was just much smaller for for europe you couldn't travel as quickly you know the communication lines were it was much harder to communicate you couldn't mass educate people there wasn't really a there wasn't a mass media there were local journals and newspapers, but there wasn't an ability to kind of merge and kind of forge people into one collective identity. So you lived in a small world. You lived in a small world where really there was kind of like a village patriarch type figure or a village council type filler figure who would who would really be the the you know the the stone where the what your world tilted around or, or spun around. It wasn't like this loyalty to some national state. 
in in Paris or something or this national state in Warsaw or Berlin. It was your local your your local tribe village or whatever. So that was really the dynamic. You know, this concept of nation or nationalism didn't really exist until, you know, state structures became more powerful and used that really to um, you know, expand and become more powerful. But um, you know, in academic discourse, the Poles are seen as this example of an ethnic type of nationalism. So national identity that is strongly bound up by the Polish language and Catholicism. And today that image is very true. Poland is about 96% or nine, I think even more. Um, vast majority, more so than other European countries, um, they're ethnically Polish. Yep, I definitely when I say more concur so, with that stat. Poland is yeah. definitely more Polish than other European nations. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to <laughs> no, say no, that know, know. Poland is more Pol Poland is more Polish than Germany is German Correct. or France <laughs> is friend. Like those countries have much higher ethnic diversity and and, and and migrants and you know, Poland has extremely strong immigration laws to keep it ninety six, ninety seven percent ethnically Polish and Polish speaking. And even now with all these Ukrainian refugees, you hear complaints like, Hey, like, are these people going to be speaking Ukrainian or are they going to be learning Polish? That's fascinating. Um, now the thing is in the early 20th century, there was a very different dynamic going on because the predecessor state of the Polish second Republic the state that is progressively partitioned out of existence in 1772, 1793, and then 1795. There's three different partitions um, that the Austrians, Germans, and, and Russians engage in. Um, actually, I think the Austrians only engage in two out of the three, the first and the third one. So they don't do the, the second, the one in 19, 1793. But I digress. They're the ones who kind of chop up the former collapsing Commonwealth consisting of the kingdom of Poland and the grand duchy of Lithuania. So it was a dual commonwealth. And I think many Polish historians will um, subsume the grand duchy of Lithuania into this general term Poland, mm -hmm. really with the intention of implying that the grand duchy was just a junior partner in the union. And it was really just Poland. You know, it was a Polish empire, essentially, or mm -hmm. a Polish ruling class, and the Lithuanians were just kind of like this autonomous zone. I don't really know how true that is. I'm not an expert on this government or the powers or, or you know, who hold the, held the, who, the, the true strings. But in, you know, the history I've read, read from Polish historians, they de certainly make it seem like the Lithuanians were just like, kind of like this junior partner subservient to the, the, like the Polish nobility class. Um, again, I don't know how true that is. Right. And that, that's interesting that, that a lot of historians will imply that because, you know, Lithuania is still a thing now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's just very interesting how they, how they decided, all right, well, this is mostly or basically Poland. But I think what's interesting is that only the central and Eastern, like two thirds of today's Poland overlap with the western half of the former commonwealth like kingdom of poland part and the remaining third of today's poland in the west was ceded by germany after world war ii so today's western poland was historically part of prussia and the holy roman empire so it wasn't poland to begin with and the eastern half of the territory you know the the commonwealth is is basically basically modern-day Belarus, um, Lithuania, and parts of Ukraine, with some territories included in, like, Estonia and Latvia and Russia. So those places, that part of it was also wasn't Poland. Yeah, the, that part is, like, not Poland at all. It's all, it's all, it's Belarus, uh, Lithuania, and, and Ukraine. Ukraine. It's all, it's just, mm -hmm. like, it's basically the Baltic, the Baltic states. I mean, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a humongous landmass, it was the largest pop out of like out of one state structure for about a 50 year period. It had the largest population in Europe mm -hmm. or so it might be longer than that, but it was a humongous structure and it was probably the most powerful 
state institution in Europe for about a 40 to 50 year period. So they were a yeah. juggernaut at one part point for, for a little over a generation. Yeah, for sure. For, for, I mean, yeah, it's, for, it's, it's super weird. I mean, it, like all, all of this weird border stuff, uh, like aside, you know, obviously polls are, you know, real, you know, the people exist, right? Even if we're unclear about where, where they, where their territory or their, their land was supposed to be. So like, maybe we can talk about like, who are, like, who are the Poles? Like, who are these people? The Poles are descendants of the Slavs who settled in the plains of Northern Europe between the rivers of, of Oder and Vistula. So the first Polish state that comes into existence is the ninth century, is in the ninth century. It's from, it's the Pius dynasty. And the founder is a man named Pius the Wheelwright, who is basically a King Arthur type figure, meaning he probably wasn't a real person. He was more yeah. of just kind of the, a man than a myth and a legend. Mm -hmm. um, so the people living in this region were always under the threat from their neighbors. So their neighbors being Germanic and then uh, Germanic tribes to the west and other slavic tribes to the to the east the thing about poland is that the landscape is flat there's no natural borders there's no mountains there's no oceans it's a very difficult place to defend or to establish defensive positions and it's a place that's basically asking to get invaded it's not a great place to mm -hmm. start a state thus any state that existed in this region always relied on some sort of alliance. Mm -hmm. So the leadership of the Pious Dynasty, they allied, they allied itself with the Holy Roman Emperor. They converted to Roman Christianity, and essentially they placed the state under the authority of the Pope throughout the, you know, throughout the Middle Ages. And what this does, it links Poland to the West during the great east-west schism in the 11th century because you know in eastern europe and poland's in eastern europe it's traditionally most eastern europeans are are you know christian orthodox rather than roman catholic right. this is the reason why they they stay catholic now during the next several hundred years um you know, there's a complicated history that we're not going to get into because it would take too long. But there's a, you know, there's a history of partitions into smaller states and then reunifications and, and vice versa. The big major development in terms of state structures that that's really important to understand and to mark down is, is the Union of Lublin that takes place in 1569 when it, it's basically a formal political and military alliance between Poland and Lithuania is created and it's a shared monarch. And, um, you know, they were united under this single state, but these entities, they retain their separate legal identities and, and administrative apparatuses. Both of these states were completely dominated by their noble classes. It was a, it was a purely feudal system. And it was a lot like Russia, mm -hmm. meaning that it was a... You know, it was dumb. It was the relation. The dynamic was that, um, you know, serfdom was the dominant form of relationship between the peasants and the nobility. So, big serf, huge serf population, small no nobility, no noble class. It was noble a multi-level marketing shots. scheme, basically. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> it, it was. It was. It was quite an intense feudal system there. Now this this Commonwealth. So you touched on some of the territory. It's, it's so it's you know at its height includes what's in modern day Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Latvia, Estonia, Russia. Um, in the Polish part, Latin was the was the most spoken language or the official language that is, which was spread by the Jesuit educational system. Um, the Lithuanian part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, they spoke Ruthenian languages. And then there was also big German populations as well. And um, but, but what was more important than language was religion. So 
Polishness it, it correlated with Catholicism. Um, Ruthenians and Lithuanians they they um, you know correlated with with Greek Catholicism and or in, in Orthodoxy. Uh, Prussianists and Germans with Lutheranism and, and you know Jews with Judaism. There's also big you know Jewish populations here. Um, in the 18th century, the Commonwealth <clears throat> starts to fall apart due to you know a combination of a lot of like different internal revolts and peasants revolts and and just they had a lot of different issues. Um, there were three separate partitions, so. I mentioned this before, I think, 1772, 1793, 1795. Russia received 62% 62 of the Commonwealth's territory and then about 48% of its population. It's a big chunk. Yeah. Its partitions owed, its, its partition zone coincided with today's southern Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and then west central Ukraine. The Habsburg gained about 18% of uh, Polish-Lithuanian lands. They get about 30% of the inhabitants. Um, today, their zone would be split between Western Ukraine and then Southeastern and Central Poland. And then Prussia took 20% of the Commonwealth's area and 22% of its populace, including the city of Warsaw. And they, in Prussia, uh, annexes the largest polish speaking population what you would call you know but i guess in technical terms the slavophone catholics mm -hmm. so polish you know prussia is yeah mm -hmm. the, so prussia is this unique entity because you think of it always being very german but in reality prussia was of you know very much of slavic dramatic character rather than just of german character because there was a lot of slavs that lived there so um, Poland is restored as an independent state briefly by Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon sought the support of Polish nobles during his camp campaigns against the Polish and the Russians, excuse me, against the, the Prussians and the Russians. And the new state that was created, that he created was the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. And, um, you know, it didn't contain all the territories, but, um, it did receive, you know, land from Napoleon and, and, you know, the Poles there, they greeted Napoleon with, but as liberate, as a liberator, um, the Polish nobles believed it was the first step to the later resurgence of Poland, Lithuania. Now from an ethno-linguistic perspective, this duchy was the first Polish state in modern times. It's estimated that Poles or Slavophone Catholics accounted for about 80% of the population there. Now, the Duchy of Warsaw doesn't last that long because Napoleon's obviously defeated when in, at Moscow. And this becomes really one of the great national humiliations in Polish history because at the Congress of Vienna, you know, meant to kind of settle all the affairs from the Napoleonic War, a lot of this no this noble class, they were trying to recreate a, get some type of Polish state out of this, and they end up not getting it. So they were denied their own state at the Congress of Vienna. The Duchy of Warsaw was then organized into an autonomous Grand Duchy of Posen or Poznan, um, with with German and Polish being co official languages. So this leads to. German becoming the dominant language and really the language that's used in as in you know within the administration apparatus now um before the the, the Napoleonic Wars the you know the Lutheran Prussian elite looked at German itself as a peasant language mm -hmm. they also hated Latin Due to due to its uh, you know ideological link with Catholicism, what was spoken by the Prussian elite was French, just like the Russians. It's really you know, the Russian elite and the Russian elite and the front and the Prussian elite they all spoke French to each other. That was the language of like you know the rich people. That was the language of the of the of the upper class. All the people who spoke these Germanic and Slavic languages were basically just these poor peasant people. 
Yeah, Film Vault. We are one of the original film podcasts. That can't be true. That there was like two other film podcasts when we began, Brian. How long have we been doing the show? You and I first sat down and did a version of the show over 20 years ago. My now. God. There is shtick, but it's very little shtick. We like. finish each other's sandwiches. Close enough. Was that a joke on a movie? Yeah, that's from uh, Frozen. Oh, it is. Pretty bad. Ugh. Oh, look at you. I don't want to be like quoting and, Frozen Anderson, on this promo. Okay, peek behind the curtain. Anderson's nope. like the Frozen guy. Like He'll constantly reference animated films, family films, and I'm more the edgy indie guy. We do have the tropey thing going on where Brian does like the big Hollywood sexy summer movies. I'm always looking for like the hidden gems. Mm. Two episodes each week. One. We review movies and the first episode and the second one, top five time. Top five, different top five every week. Movies that made you cry. Worst movie accents. Most disturbing movies. All right, The Film Ball, check it out. Wherever you find a fine podcasts. That's right, The Film Vault's going on 20 plus years. Hello everyone, it's Takuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. What happened was that these elites... Global elites. These uh, are these you know, bougie these, people. These these elite global elite pedophiles. They realized that Prussia's population was overwhelmingly dramatic speaking. They were most likely never going to learn French, so German was used as a language taught in the elementary school system. And you know, a lot of the elementary schools, you know, the elementary school system is, is essentially created to, to create this sense of national cohesion, right? Within Teach the state. Young. So there would be no domination from you know, there. I mean, because Napoleon, you know, destroyed all these German states, right? You know, he broke them all up and used them as playthings. So they were like, we're not letting that happen again. We need to get some national pride and start teaching German and getting people not to run away in battle because they're fighting for something much greater than their local town. They're fighting for this great Prussian or German state. Now, in Russia, another unit is created called the Kingdom of Poland. And I know this is probably getting confusing at this point. Yeah. I've gone cro- I've gone cross-eyed myself, I have to say. Because there's all these different names, these Polish kingdoms, and there's multiple Polish kingdoms. So this and is there's separate, different Poland Polish congresses, in Russia, right? And I think I've gone cross-eyed. Um, yeah, it's confusing. But there's another entity. The, the other big entity is obviously in Russia. Mm-hmm. Kingdom of Poland, Congress Poland is another way to use it. I think we'll just call it Congress Poland. It was this semi-autonomous state in the Russian Empire with the czar taking the title king of poland so my family didn't live in this part of poland they lived in kiev which wasn't part of congress poland um i think they may have been part from there i know some of their family was from warsaw at some point it's confusing it's hard to trace back your family roots um but with um with the czar taking the czar took the title of kingdom king of poland and um you know in Congress, Poland, the czar's actual policy, so Nicholas I was a czar at this time, his actual policy was to preserve the Polish language. And the reason why is that the Polish-speaking part of the population tended to be education, educated. I almost said they tended to be educational. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see that clip? It's like a It's a pro wrestling clip where... Um, the wrestler, I forget what wrestler it is, but he's talking to a journalist. And he's like, you're not even a real journalism. <laughs> <laughs> you're not even a real journalism. <laughs> okay, so so Czar, right? Czar Nicholas, he's got this other Poland in Russia called 
Congress Poland. He's technically the king of this Poland, and he's preserving Polish in there because the Polish people tended to be in the more educated, and you know that's good for economic development, basically, right? Yeah, because again, Poland Polish is in, in a large part is a language spoken by the the nobility class mm-hmm. of the Commonwealth, so a lot of them tended to to be educated. God, it's really hard to keep this straight. Um, I think uh, maybe we can read a quote um, by Tomasz Kamusela, uh, and, and maybe this will help us kind of sort this out a little bit. Uh, it reads, The Russian policy of preserving Polish as the language of administration in its partition zone of Poland-Lithuania and in the Congress Kingdom, coupled with the rapid development of the Polish language educational systems in both areas, achieved something that had eluded reformers from Poland-Lithuania's Commission of National Education. The Russian authorities' decisions created a genuine, though nascent, Polish language book market, whose mainstay was the production of textbooks for the two Polish language educational systems. These developments convinced many Polish-Lithuanian nobles and the coalescing Polish intelligentsia, who emerged among the nobles, uh, excuse me, nobles, that it was practical and advisable to buy and read Polish language books. It was then in the Polish ethno-national case that the epoch of vernacular print capitalism tentatively commenced, so crucial for imagining any nation into existence. Okay, so (laughs) they just sold them shit. (laughs) They were like, hey, if we get everybody to learn Polish, then we could sell a bunch of Polish books. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, the more the language went around, I mean, the more people spoke it. Are there, are there and the more good, people like, spoke it? What, what are what are some Polish writers? I don't know. The 18th century. Are you trying to say another Polish joke? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I don't recognize any of these names, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce any of them either. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so I mean. The point is, this Polish identity is based on language. It's yeah. starting to, and, and this identity is starting to form across all these different partition zones. The political situation started to change when segments of the Polish Lithuanian nobility realized that the Tsar was not really eager to reestablish Polish, you know, the, the old Commonwealth system. And as a result, there's a noble anti Russian uprising that breaks out in 1830 and this uprising basically i mean there's just sporadic polish nobility uprisings for about a 30-year period and these uprisings are brutally suppressed the russians they crack down on the polish language and Russian is eventually introduced as a compulsory subject in polish schools i'm sure that really hurt their polish book sales yeah. <laughs> now, many Poles who did not want to submit to these conditions, they moved to Galatia. So that's that was referred to as Austrian Poland. Oh, Galatia. There's another Poland, Austrian Poland. <laughs> yeah, there's three Polands. There's Austrian Poland. So Austrian Poland is is uh, what we consider Galatia, which is now Western Ukraine. Um, it's where Lviv is. It is. A completely different political atmosphere. Poles living under Franz Joseph I were in a much better position than their compatriots in Russian Poland. Since 1860, Galatia had enjoyed extensive political and cultural autonomy. And they had a local parliament. Uh, Polish culture was essentially, you know, flourishing. It was able to really develop without any type of political obstacles. And Polish had even become the official language here. The Poles in Galatia, they enjoyed a privileged status. So they they were um, politi- politically and economically dominant over other ethnic and religious groups, such as Ukrainians and Jews, um, who together made up more than half the population in Galatia. So this dynamic is is actually you know one of the things that that foreshadows the genocide that's perpetrated by Ukrainian national groups against Poles 
in, in Eastern Galatia during World War II. But I digress. I don't want to get too off topic. Okay. Um, maybe we can focus a little bit on on another pol- another another Poland, which is the Prussian Poland, which we've kind of already been talking about. But uh, th- this Prussian Poland was probably the worst of the Polands for Polish people because they had some of the harshest restrictions uh, where they had a basically ruthless process of Germanization. Um, Bismarck, uh, who was ruling Prussia at the time, was basically determined to create a unified German nation state under Prussian leadership. Uh, So he's trying to do his own German thing. So basically he was super hostile towards any non-German national groups that happened to fall into his territory. And they only became more restrictive after Germany ultimately unified into into Germany. And and at the same time, the Polish population is actually increasing uh, in the region of Poznan, and the Poles uh, of the region were typically wealthier. So the German government tried to uproot the Polish nobility, all these rich Polish people, by breaking up Polish estates and replacing them with German peasants. Um, The civil and the military bureaucracy basically boycotted Polish businessmen and professionals, and they didn't award them any government contracts for any of the goods and services that they provided. So there was a lot of that going on. Um, Government workers were forbidden to, you know, go to Polish restaurants and shops. So if you were in the government, you can't get no pierogies. And, you know, a lot of the Polish state's uh, employees were basically booted. They were transferred out of their provinces into other ones. and, And others failed to attain just promotions or... A lot of them were actually dismissed, like they, they got shit canned because they didn't, quote, meet like, you know, government's sharp demands or, or they weren't, you know, they didn't have good national behavior or whatever that meant. Um, they also, uh, uh, new appointments uh, were made to these publicly funded jobs uh, um, and they were exclusively staffed by Germans, despite the fact that Polish taxes contributed to the creation of those positions in, in no small degree. So you know, talk about representation, uh, no representation, (laughs) taxation without representation. So basically, you know, shit place for the Polish people to live at the time. Uh, and and this oppression once again, just starts creating like bubbling up this, this idea of Polish national movements in, in the German Poland. Yeah. And and I think, you know, because, you know, you know, German history, you study German history. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know you're, you're aware of kind of like the German, the dynamic between like Germans and Poles, you know, throughout the 20th century. It's been Um, tenuous. (laughs) It's been tenuous. And and that's why you get in the 20th century, you, you, you do get incredibly hostile Polish governments towards Germans. Mm -hmm. Like, like a lot it's, and I mean, I mean, violence begets violence type of thing, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, Obviously, that's a truth for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they you get know, it from both sides. Right? They're getting discriminate. It, they're getting it from the German side. They're getting it from the Russian side. Pretty much, the only the only the Galician side of it was like a nice place for the Polish people. So, yeah, I mean that that definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, very easily creates a, <laughs> a very as, angry as much as people, people as much as people shit on the Habsburgs. They were they were definitely out of all the three empires in Central and Eastern Europe. They were definitely the most tolerant towards ethnic minorities because they had to be, and they're the ones that like you know have the counter peg of uh, ethnic violence that breaks out that you know really starts World War. I mean, they didn't have it in their borders, but it obviously involved them. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the powder keg, powder keg that that blows it up, but they're um, you know they were definitely the most tolerant and it's probably because they had so many different minorities they right. had 13 different minorities that were you know that represented at least more than like two percent of the population so they, they had a harder job to run a, a a nation like that yeah and then they also just uh the dual monarch uh, basically the big power struggle when it came to kind of putting down one ethnic group it was always the third ethnic group which was tended to be slavics um, and that usually came from the Hungarians because the Austrians usually would want to empower uh, kind of a third ethnic group to, um, to to 
balance against the Hungarians, and the Hungarians would be like, hey, 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 we signed up for a two a two dominant system. Not we don't need like a Sla- like a third Slavic uh, part of this no part tripartite, of this empire. right? No tripartite state. So there was there was this kind of interesting dynamic between between the Hungarians and the Austrians and trying to work with these different ethnic ethnic ethnicities. Um, but to your point about, you know, solidifying Polish nationalism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, discrimination and stuff that, that usually kind of creates that, you know, it's like kind of like that old argument where, where, um, you hear from Israelis or Zionists where they're like, well, there was no Palestinian, Palestinian group ever before 1940. Right. And then, or 1946. And I'm like, well, you know, even if you're right about that, which I'm not saying you are correct about that. Right. You're but even if that, you right? are, <laughs> even if, even if you are, even if you are right about that, there certainly is one now. Right. <laughs> like there's certainly not one that exists now. Right. And that, that a lot of times the identity is created in the face of some type of adversity. oppression, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. adversity or, 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 or something like that. Um, it, so it's, it exists now, and once it exists, and once enough people say that there are people, then that's just that's all it really takes. Or to put it? Pandora back in the box, yeah. Once people start to have a national, like if somebody, a new ethnic group could theoretically just appear out of nowhere, right? You know, if they just lived in the same place for a couple of decades and had their own dialect, they would be the Gorkistani people, for example. Right. Mm-hmm. That can happen right now if we wanted to. That can happen right now. We can play. I mean, it just, it literally just happened. You know, the Israelis mm-hmm. created a state out of nothing. They're just mm-hmm. like, hey, let's, we're a bunch of Jews in Eastern Europe. Let's create a state and start speaking Hebrew again. They didn't right. speak Hebrew. They were speaking Yiddish. And they're like, hey, why don't we just bring back the old language? That's a crazy thing to me. I'm not saying crazy bad. I'm just saying it's a crazy, like, project. It's a crazy that idea. It's so inconceivable. Just... Yeah, that like, you just stand up a, a a nation like that. Yeah, like, hey guys, let's. L- this isn't working out for us. Life in the pale is not working out. We need to get out of the Russian Empire. We need to get out of, Austria. you know, we need to get out of these states and create our own create our own thing. Right. And we what we're going to do Germany, is that to to make this more powerful, we are going to bring back Hebrew as a language so we need to learn hebrew that's crazy right. i mean even ukraine i mean even they, they like knew, they knew ukraine, hebrew vis-a-vis their their like you know no but religion but they like, knew hebrew but but religion but not like it wasn't like the the yiddish was the popular language that was spoken between correct. people it wasn't like people were speaking hebrew and the pale to each other mm-hmm. for like business it was the religious language that was used for religious ceremonies mm-hmm. it's kind of like the ukrainian thing too where you know, Zelensky didn't speak Ukrainian up until about 10 years ago, you know, prior, maybe sooner than that. But he wasn't, you know, his career was a Russian comedian, basically. You know, he was popular in Russia. And he recently just learned Ukrainian. A lot of Ukrainian politicians just recently learned Ukrainian. And you can argue, like, oh, was Ukrainian really kind of an ethnicity group that appeared out of nowhere, or was it? We have or whole was episodes it? about it. It doesn't this. exist now. <laughs> well, it certainly exists now. Exactly. You know, like, it exists at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you can't, once you create one or create this, and especially if it's backed by a state, mm-hmm. which, which we'll get into, Pol- you know, Polish nationalism is, is sort of backed by states at some point. Um, you know, it's it's really impossible to go away. To, to more to that point, once, before once we move exist. on, just one last random rabbit hole is that there are plenty of like would be nations that exist that cross different geographic boundaries, uh, but because they're not backed by states, they don't exist. So I'm talking about you know like our 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 good friends, the Rojavians. <laughs> what was that? Um free rojava or some shit like that do you remember that way back in the day rojava when it's like those um because you mean the kurds right yeah of course so yeah so when they created the 
so when the Kurds in eastern Syria created Rojava, so the Kurds were, you know, they didn't like lean, lean with Muslim or Islam. They led with like socialism, communist type stuff. And what happened is that it attracted some groups of like leftist communist kind of guerrilla wannabes. Um, the sort of people who would join like Antifa. So it attracted them and they went over to Rojava to fight. And the Turks, they went up to fight in a, in a city called Afrin and the Turks just blew them up, just killed a bunch of these kids or people. But there's a video of, um, there's a video of, um, them like pr promoting like we stand with the people of Rojava and it's it looks so you know like a, a Starbucks barista convention <laughs> it is very funny yeah <laughs> we stand. but there there um, goes like a like like I mean talk about candidate for a state right for a nation state here's a people with a with a mostly similar language there's obviously dialects that that change with a mostly similar culture with a shared you know uh, uh, long-standing history like going back to antiquity but because they're not stood up by some nation state, you know, they're not backed by somebody else more powerful. They're just not. They've, they've gotten the shit into the state for some time. Well, they are backed by somebody powerful called the United States. Well, but not the United that States, backed, otherwise they'd be a thing. Yeah. The United States sees them more useful as kind of like this cannon fodder. Um, <laughs> yeah. This floating diaspora that can like do their bidding in parts of the world rather right. than you know, providing them with their own solidified state because then right. that would just like kind of defeat the purpose of using them as proxies. Right. Um, they rather than, they rather than bother to, the Syrians and the Turkic and yeah. the Turkish and, and the Iraqis and other parts. And then when the Kurds got their, you know, their, you know, in Northern Iraq, the Kurds are basically free, you know, from the mm -hmm. central government. They right. can kind of do what they want. They basically have their state there. Um, you know, to create that institution, they fucking ethnically cleansed Arabs out of there. They were, there was ethnic cleansing campaigns. Mm -hmm. So it was a brutal process. You know, mm -hmm. this, this, this always is. Because it's like, the sad thing is, it's like when you want to create a nation state, when you want to create like this ethnic homogeneous state where everyone speaks the same language and you need, and you want to create it out of like, you know, pick a historic land that goes to some legend or something chances are you're going to have to ethnically cleanse somebody or force if they don't want to go them, right mm -hmm. force assimilate you got two options force assimilate or ethnically cleanse them and a lot of times it's easier to ethnically cleanse them to force than force assimilate mm -hmm. and it's just like almost every state like the 20th century is just the a long history of people being ethnically cleansed this so many different people are just forcibly removed from their homes and that's right. like pretty much every ethnic group because there's um, no new land east of right? the Rhine like, river like a fucking yeah. country doesn't pop out of the you know ocean <clears throat> one day and say hey it, here's here's like a new place for you to make your new country it, and that's why the creation of israel at the time was just like, all right, well, I mean, this has been happening for freaking decades. Like, wasn't so, it proposed what's to be somewhere deal? else as well? It was proposed to be in multiple places, but you know, the true goal was doing it in Israel, mm. um, Arizona, uh, uh, Zimbabwe. I forget what African country it was supposed to be in. I want to say Zimbabwe. Um, there's a couple different places. I think there were some t territories in in um, in um, in South America, there's Alaska was British proposed, Uganda, Arizona, um, yeah, Uganda, Obla uh, a Ari specific autonomous oblast in the U uh, USSR. Um, oh, this is a weird one. F the Fugu plan was in Japan. Can you imagine a Japanese Israel? <laughs> that would certainly be unique. Oh, they had a Madagascar there plan. Um, yeah. Serial killers, strange disappearances, unexplained mysteries, terrible disasters. I'm Nate Hale, and in my show, The Conspirators, I'm here to tell you all the stories from history your teacher never told you about. 
Hear the real story behind the Bermuda Triangle. Or about the history of people drinking blood to stay young. Or about the serial killer operating in Nazi-occupied Paris. Or what dark secret lurked within the walls of a Scottish castle. In my show, The Conspirators, I take you on a journey through some of the darkest corners of history, where you'll hear about the folklore, myths, and misconceptions behind some of the darkest events that ever happened. Listen to The Conspirators on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, sometimes the truth really is stranger than fiction. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Captain Morgan, Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we explore the real lives of these pirates. We examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. The real stories are a lot more complex and a lot more interesting than the stories most of us have been told. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, join us on the Pirate History Podcast. There's a book? Um, so, there's a book called The Yiddish Policeman's Union. And... The book is about, it's a murder mystery, and it takes place in an alternate history where the Jews lose the Arab-Israeli war, and they're forced to go live in Alaska, like the state of Israel is created in, in Alaska, mm-hmm. and it's a murder mystery, like, involving in that alternate timeline. It's weird. But that was, yeah, it was like, what a strange book. Nobody wants to live in Alaska. They pay you to live in Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. We are getting off topic. So going back to Polish patriot movements. So Polish patriotism, it rallied around the idea of you know, recreating the multicultural state of the Commonwealth. But the problem was, how could a political and civic identity survive the state's destruction? The Commonwealth doesn't exist anyway, so how do we create like an identity or loyalty towards it? It hasn't existed for 100 years at this point. The Polish Patriot Movement of the 19th century consisted mostly of the noble class. And, you know, the reason why they were rebelling is because they didn't want to share power. You know, they didn't, they found themselves, you know, uh, under the yoke of autocratic Prussia, Russia, and, and, you know, the Habsburg Empire. This so this Polish form of nationalism it takes this kind of romant this form of romantic struggle so for liberty and freedom you know you'll you know you get a lot of Polish Poles who volunteer to fight in different revolutionary groups around the world like the American Revolution you know the American Revolution we had like Polish trainers and stuff mm-hmm. um, also in the French Revolution you know you have Poles who who are volunteering there so you get like kind of like this Polish you know romantic movement romanticization you know, um, yeah romanticization and, and and kind of poles are looked like that throughout history where we we definitely as a historical group we 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 do definitely romanticize poles and polish resistance against not only the nazis but also the soviet union because right. i mean they really got the shit into the stick that was horrible to get invaded by both of them polish legionaries in ukraine right now yeah so, yeah, exactly. There's Polish mercenaries and stuff in Ukraine. Um, but, yeah, so it takes this kind of dynamic of romanticism and liberty and freedom. Um, and, then you know, there was a series of different insurrections. Um, you know, the Poles fought for their independence in, in, in the <coughs> Napoleonic Wars, you know, throughout basically the 1800s in, in Russia. Um, the largest bringing the January insurrection, which was... Again, brutally suppressed by the Russian Empire. January 6, 1848. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> due to the failure of these revolutionary movements, many of the Polish patriots become disenchanted with these movements that they now felt were utopian and unrealistic in their demands for universal liberty. So in the mid-19th century, there was an increasing development of this national conscious among the peasantry, and not just in Poland or Polish lands, across pretty much everywhere. And the nobility came to view the, the, the um, you know, regaining national independence movement would be impossible without support of the masses. So this is where this new modern understanding of Polishness came into being. You know, Poles became defined as a linguistic or ethnic term, irrespective of their of their political consciousness or their historic association with lands of an old Polish state. So this new school of modern nationalists started seeing the armed struggle for independence and 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 the the um, you know abstract principle principle of of uh, of liberty as not only unrealistic but but counterproductive due to their experiences you know rebelling against the russians so they wanted to focus on creating this concept of polishness among the masses so um you know there came these rival schools of thoughts in poland you know was was poland a civic tradition or is it an actual ethnic people is it a civic tradition like you know how we look at america today right um you know some people do look like you know there are people who do look like america as kind of a white historic country others see it as a civic as a you know civic tradition rather or peoples same thing with france um so like what is it like is it are, are we a peoples or are we a civic multicultural institution that that we're trying to recreate now, um, as geopolitical tensions grew between the central powers and Russia, Polish nationalists started to look at the growing antagonism as a way to regain their independence. By the early 20th century, Polish opinion was divided into basically two political camps. One camp was pro-Russian. The others were pro-Central Power, pro-Austrian, and pro-German. And the pro-Russian camp was led by a man named Roman Domowski. And Domowski was a leader of a Polish political group within the Russian Empire known as the National Democrats. And in his view, the future military conflict that was going to take place would have a racial character and it would be fought between Teutonic Germany and Slavic Russia, in his words. So in the future war, Poles should sympathize with, with and actively help Russia, who after the victory would unite all ethnic Polish territories and grant them autonomy within the Russian Empire. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, other groups found it better to collaborate with Germany. And, you know, the argument between them, or among them, was during the Middle Ages, when Poland was under German patronage, the country had received all, you know, all these significant contributions, such as Christianity and, you know, different advancements in technology, and that all came through the West and through Germany. So, um, you know, there was, there was this type of attachment, you know, because a big part of Polish heritage is not just being Slavic, it's being linked with the Roman Catholic Church in the West as a whole. Right. So, you know, the, these are the camps that are created. In addition, pro, pro-Austrian pro circles argued that the Habsburg monarchy, monarchy offered the best conditions for the Poles, which it did, because the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was a safe haven for Poles in the national independence struggle. And, you know, the Austrians weren't being nice you know, weren't taking them in just to be nice. They were doing it as a potential sledgehammer. You know, they they thought, hey, like these poles, 
in Galatia, what they could possibly do is they could link up with the Poles and the Russian Empire. So if we ever get into a war with them, you know, it would be good to kind of have that in our back pocket. Fight them to, from the inside, uh, basically. Yeah, fight them from the inside because we can link the two together and we can try to get the Poles and the Russian Empire to look at our Poles and say, hey, why don't we unite? So, you know, there was this Machiavellian geopolitical reason for that. Now, there is a fourth major program for advancement of Polish interest, and this is probably by the most famous person in Polish history, is uh, Joseph Pilduski, who wanted to bring back Poland as a great power. And Pilduski, he opposed collaboration with any of the stronger neighbors of Poland. You know, he saw Poland as a great power. And more importantly, he demanded a defiant attitude towards any neighboring state more powerful than Poland. Dependence on a stronger neighbor would be tantamount to recognizing the secondary position. Ooh, excuse me. The secondary position of Poland, um, you know, in Central and Eastern Europe. Now, you can describe this policy as heroic because this policy is largely adopted. And maybe it is heroic to defend your land. But the same approach to this, you know, this foreign policy approach at the same time for a small European nation is also very reckless. Can say that again. When compared to a more, re- to, to a more, I mean, Poland was fucking de- devastated. Thirty percent of the population died in World War II. Right. Um, when compared to the more, you know, real politic approach of aligning with a more powerful neighboring state, this is this can be considered extremely radical. And not to mention, and I'm not going to get too into this because it will just make this subject more complicated. There's a shit ton of fucking Marxists in Poland at the time too, and socialists. Um, specifically, a lot of them were in the Prussian side, not as much in the Russian side. So there's a shit ton of fucking Marxists and stuff and socialists. P- Pilduski comes from kind of this socialist background, um, but he's not like a pure commie. He kind of understands that the, the natural conclusion of communism is going to be bad, but he comes from that tradition. So I'll try to wrap this up because we're over an hour. When the war breaks out, the Poles are actually put into this advantageous position. The Russians, Germans, and the Habsburg all offered pledges of concessions and future autonomy in exchange for Polish loyalty. There was, you know, there was some Russian territory that the Austrians wanted to incorporate into Galicia. Um, you know, one of the reasons why they let Polish nationalism fester in their borders. Meanwhile, the Russians... Um, you know, they recognized the Polish right to autonomy and then promised to give them Galicia uh, and Poznan and Silesia. Now, th- these were all parts of, Aust- you know, central power Polish territories. Now, as the war turned into a long stalemate, the issue of Polish st- uh, self-rule became more urgent. Um, you know, we some of the main political figures, Roman Domowski, he spent the years in Western Europe hoping to persuade the Allies to unify the Polish lands under Russian rule as their initial step towards liberation. And just to kind of point out, Domowski and Pildusky are both like lifelong rivals. When Domowski dies, Podolski doesn't allow any state representatives to go to the funeral. They hate each other. Um, Domowski believed in this kind of preservation of this of Polish culture culture through national identity. And again, his vision was really centered around the concept of ethnicity in a homogeneous nation state. Pilduski, who comes from the Polish Socialist Party, he believed in creating this multi-ethnic federation. You know, he, he favored this more inclusive approach to, to building this nation. Now, um, going back... What Pilduski does, though, prior to the war breaking out, he had correctly predicted that a European war was about to break out and that this war was going to destroy all three partitioners. So he wants to take the pragmatic approach. Um, He had been working with the Austrians. He had been working with them to create different paramilitary groups. 
um, you know, prior to the war breaking out with collaboration with the Austrian government. And um, basically, they were allowed to do that to, you know, again, attract Russian volunteers from from the Russian side um, to eventually use against them. Now, um, in 1916, when the war is dragging on, a decision in Germany was made to restore Poland. And the reason why they wanted to do this was to create a buffer between them and the Russians. And this was going to be called the kingdom of Poland. And, um, what are we on? Like you know, the fifth gonna, kingdom was, of Poland at this point? <laughs> yeah. The grand duchy of Poland, Congress, Poland, Polish, Austria. Um, you know, it was located on the, on the territories of the formerly Russian ruled Congress Poland held by central powers. And, um, you know, German propaganda pamphlets targeted Poles when they invaded saying, you know, their soldiers were going to arrive to, to liberate Poland from the Russian empire. Now, um, during the war, the Germans do carry out ethnic cleansing campaigns against the Poles. The, um, you know, the political unit that the, the Germans are trying to create during World War I, they were trying to push that Polish territory, those borders that they promised, east to where it actually was. So they were actually trying to stay, they were trying to push the state and then resettle Polish lands with Germans. So, so they're basically saying like, okay, they're trying to, to move the Poland. country over. Yeah. We want to create a Poland, but can you move your Poland closer to Russia? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they were trying to create a Poland. So they were, but they, they were trying to move it. So to serve mainly strictly really as a buffer state. Right. Um, so it was, uh, the Polish border strip. That's what they were. That's what they were trying to resettle. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I guess something that's key to understanding is that Russian Poland or Congress Poland is conquered by by Germany or very early into the war, very like very quickly into the war they conquer that area that that territory. Um, so essentially, this state, you know, they they unite the poles essentially. And um, during the war, and this is the state, and I'm going to end it here because my voice is starting to hurt. This is a state that eventually becomes the entity that is created after World War I and that exists between 1918 and 1939 until the Soviets, until uh, you know World War II happens and the Soviets and the Germans invade them. Um, but really the purpose of this episode was, cause again, you know, we're, we plan on talking about world war two a lot over the next, I don't know how long, at least months. Um, I think it's important to lay out kind of like the different histories of these states that are so involved in the war and their existence because um, all these states have such a really fascinating and very confusing histories and when we start to explore different concept of concepts of world war ii i think it's going to be important to be able to draw back and reference this type of stuff of course we didn't go to into any part of this timeline in great detail because we would just get stuck forever so we really just meant to do kind of a high level overview of the creation of the polish nation state and there's still a lot more because we're not even covering the period, the interwar period. We're just covering, you know, the early history to the, um, you know, essentially the unification of the of the state. I'm not going to get too much into like the constitution ratification process because that stuff is boring, but it's truly fascinating. And a lot of the in another episode in the future, I'm not sure when we're going to do it. I want to go into kind of the, the ethnic dynamic of Germans and Poles and how that leads to a pretext for the Germans to invade. Right. For um, Laban's realm. For, yeah. 
But um, is there anything else you want to add to this? No, man. I mean, this, this is this is honestly really crazy, and I'm I'm really happy that you did the the bulk of the work here because uh, Polish history wasn't isn't like a a huge uh, area of expertise that I have. Obviously, it overlaps quite a bit with German history because of the reasons that we described today. But it's really fascinating just to like hear about how how amorphous I think that's a good word for this. How amorphous the idea of Poland is, and how 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 much it it changed and i think it really gives great context to you know the periods leading right up to you know that that interwar period and what ultimately helped cause world war ii because you know at the end of all of this crazy story with i got i don't know how many polands we talked about like five or six of like we went through five or six iterations of of polands uh and you know each with their varying you know levels of autonomy each with varying levels of 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 you know ideologies and and now suddenly after world war one they've got like a they've got a spot right they they're finally in a spot where they can unify and and frankly the borders of it doesn't make a ton of sense it's you know it's just what they ended up getting uh in some ways it's really good for them but you know leading up to world war ii no spoiler alerts it in in other ways it just becomes like a target <laughs> for invasions from both sides so um crazy it's, I mean, and then in Pol- Poland is basically controlled by a military junta for yeah. it's, so it's, it's not saying that I mean, as a Polish person, I'm definitely not saying that the, Pol- the Poles deserve to be invaded or anything, no. but the, a lot of their foreign policy played into, you know, the result that happened. Um, but yeah, it's a tragic situation. Um, so many Poles were killed. Um, I've had Pol- I have Polish relatives who were fucking killed in concentration camps. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's um, it's a tragic history which we will explore in more detail. All right, my voice is starting to crack, <laughs> which I said would happen in the beginning of this episode. Um, anything else you would like to say? No, oh, man. All right, thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Bro History. It is always a pleasure. If you want to support the show, make sure you rate and review the podcast. It is the number one way to support our show. You can also join us on Patreon. Another great way to support our show. And the best way you can support us is just to tune in every single week and join us. That's join it. us on this epic journey. <laughs> join us. All right. Peace, guys. Peace. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts.